Do you believe in the paranormal? Have you yourself seen a spook, specter, or ghost? If so, you're not alone. On tonight's episode of Unsolved Mysteries, we hear accounts from three individuals who say they've witnessed the supernatural. Join me on tonight's episode of Unsolved Mysteries. This is Bruce Kelly. Throughout his life, he suffered from three overpowering phobias, a fear of flying, a fear of enclosed spaces, and a fear of water. Over the years, Bruce tried several different treatments for his anxieties, but nothing worked. In desperation, he went to Rick Brown, a hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regression. And he states, probably 99% of the people who come to me do not go into past lives. Probably only 1% of the people have spontaneous regression when working with phobias. And Bruce did have a spontaneous regression to a past life. Much to his surprise, Bruce learned that his deep irrational fears were the result of traumas that occurred years before he was born. During one session, Bruce was thrust into the life of an American sailor named James Edward Johnson. This is a photo of James Edward Johnson. Bruce said that Johnson had drowned in a submarine the USS Shark during World War II. He even named the man trapped with Johnson in the submarine, Walter Pilgrim. Bruce told Rick Brown that Johnson and Pilgrim had both died at precisely 11.34 p.m. on February 11th 1942. Bruce recalled the details that were vivid and specific. And he states, The memories were just like it was. Something that happened yesterday. They were very close to the surface. They came up real easily. At first it was like I was just making it up. Like this really can't be happening. This really can't be real. I have to be making this up. And I went to the library more to prove that it didn't happen than it did happen. Incredibly, Bruce found that the very first American sub lost in the war was the USS Shark. It was the same submarine Bruce had named under hypnosis. 
This is a copy of the transfer paper of James Edward Johnson transferring to the USS Shark. This proves as evidence that James Edward Johnson did exist and he was on the USS Shark. Over the next six months, Bruce Kelly saw Rick Brown on an average of once a week. With each session, more details on the life of James Edward Johnson emerged. In time, Rick Brown talked to Bruce as if he was James Edward Johnson. Bruce saw himself as Johnson at age 12. He was at his mother's deathbed. A young cousin named Elizabeth stood with him. Other memories were trivial. As Johnson, Bruce recalled that he always ate the end pieces from a loaf of bread. In another session, Bruce remembered that Johnson was born in February 1921. As a young man, he enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps, a Depression-era government work program. The year was 1938. The place, Tall Lake, California. Bruce and Rick began to research Johnson's life, and Bruce's memories checked out with remarkable accuracy. James Johnson had been in the CCC in 1938 and 1939, stationed at Toll Lake near the California-Oregon border, and his birth certificate confirmed that Johnson was indeed born in February of 1921. Rick Brown was more than impressed by Bruce's recollections. And he states, Bruce came up with a significant amount of information that was well past being coincidental. There were too many lines of it, evidence that pointed to the fact that Bruce Kelly is the reincarnation of James Edward Johnson. In April of 1993, five years after first being hypnotized, Bruce decided to visit Johnson's hometown in Jacksonville, Alabama at the house where Johnson and his mother had lived, Bruce experienced a strong reaction. And he states, Moving to the side of the house, when I could actually see the bedroom, and I knew that was the bedroom, that's when the feelings really started hitting. Remembering that he used to have to come in on the back street and come through the back door, the back porch. I remember that. I remember the feelings of kind of feeling like a second class citizen. They were poor. She was unmarried. Afterward, Bruce Kelly met with several people who remembered James Johnson as a boy. One of them was Johnson's cousin, Elizabeth Betty Watson. Bruce believed she was the same Elizabeth he saw under hypnosis. The little girl who was with James Johnson when his mother died. Bruce then visited the Jacksonville Cemetery. 
or a memorial stone has been erected in honor of James Edward Johnson. And as you can see by this photograph, the dates that Bruce Kelly had claimed add up. No one knows the details of Johnson's death. But Bruce Kelly's visions provide a possible scenario. According to Bruce, the USS Shark was hit by enemy fire. In his final moments, Bruce envisioned both Johnson and Pilgrim struggling in the corridor of the submarine. The two sailors would both drown. Perhaps his abrupt death signaled not the end, but the beginning for James Johnson. Perhaps his life was renewed in the person of Bruce Kelly. For generations, the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York have been a favorite vacation spot for the famous and the infamous. One summer night, in 1988, several employees of the Copewood Lodge on Big Moose Lake, including Rhonda Boslot, were approaching the staff lodge. Rhonda led the pack, unaware that someone or something might be waiting inside. And she states, I walked into the staff lodge, straight up the stairs with my hand out, reaching for the string, which is how to turn on the light. As I approached the top of the stairs, and just before I was ready to turn on the light, a feeling came over that somebody was right there. More or less, I stopped in my tracks and really just didn't move. I didn't have an overwhelming feeling of fright, but something definitely or someone was there. And it just kind of took my breath away. But the real show was outside. According to Rhonda, her friends were witnessing a spine-tingling vision. And she states, All three of them had the same exact story. It lingered for just a few seconds and then moved away. All three of them saw the ghost. I didn't see anything myself, but I felt that somebody was right there. And it was just a strange feeling. But who is haunting Big Moose Lake? People there believe and is the ghost of the young and beautiful Grace Brown. In 1906, her brutal murder shocked the nation. Decades later, Hollywood turned the notorious case into a hit film called A Place in the Sun. Hollywood portrayed Grace as an unattractive nag. But in truth, Grace Brown was a naive, lovely 19-year-old who worked at the Gillette Skirt Factory in Cortland, New York. It was there in 1905 that she met the handsome and charming Chester Gillette. The 
factory owner's nephew. Author Craig Brandon has written about the infamous Grace Brown murder, and he states, Chester Gillette was considered quite a catch by the people in town because he was popular, and he was athletic, and he was handsome. I'm sure a lot of women in Cortland were interested in him. From the start, it was a scandalous romance. According to Craig Brandon, Chester convinced Grace to see him without a chaperone, which in those days put her reputation at risk. He states, I think she saw him as the ideal person, that he was everything she wanted. She was in love probably for the first time in her life. And she wanted to see this through no matter what. For Chester, it was a secret affair. He never took Grace out in public. He never acknowledged their relationship, according to Craig Brandon. Chester was frequently seen with other young women. Especially those from the town's wealthier family. He states, her friends were warning her that he wasn't what he seemed to be, that he was something different, and I think that she had no experience with that type of person, and so she was seeing what she wanted to see rather than what her friends were telling her, but Grace could not resist Chester. And she soon discovered she was pregnant. At the time, unwed mothers were outcasts. Grace begged Chester to marry her, but he stalled as long as he could. Finally, in July of 1906, Chester took Grace to the Adirondacks. She assumed it was a wedding trip. According to Craig Branton, they rented a rowboat at Big Moose Lake from a man named Robert Morrison. Morrison expected them to come back around dinner time. And when they didn't come back, he thought that was somewhat suspicious. The next morning, Morrison organized a search party. The rowboat had capsized. A short distance from it, they found Grace's body. Two days later, police found Chester Gillette in a nearby hotel. At first, he denied even knowing Grace Brown. Then he claimed Grace had drowned herself in despair because he didn't love her anymore. Few believed him. He was tried and convicted of first degree murder on March 30th, 1908. Chester Gillette died in the electric chair. Had justice been served? Apparently not enough to satisfy the restless spirit of Grace Brown. Linda Lee Mackin had her own encounter with Grace Brown a few months after Rhonda Bosselitz. And she states, I was walking down toward the lake with my flashlight. The light was getting dimmer and dimmer. By the time I got to the edge of the lake and the rocks, my flashlight wasn't working. So I had to turn around and go back. 
I was all struck. And not only was I certain that I was looking at a ghost, but I had a very strong feeling of sadness. She was very sad. Was it the ghost of Grace Brown as depicted in this photograph? Over the years, there have been continual sightings, and many wonder if her spirit has been trapped at Big Moose Lake Lodge since the day she was drowned by her faithless lover. Hundreds of people claim they have had a bizarre experience called Missing Time. You are about to meet one of them. A member of the U.S. Air Force who disappeared for an entire hour. Under hypnosis, he described his abduction. Believe it or not, by aliens. At 8.45 p.m. on October 1st, 1966, a bus pulled up in front of Dultra's Market in the small Cape Cod village of North Truro. Only one man got off the bus. 19-year-old airman, first class, Robert Matthews. He was reporting for his first tour of duty at a nearby Air Force base and noticed that the area was deserted. And he states, I got off where the bus driver told me where I was supposed to get off. And he told me to phone the base, and they would send a truck down to pick me up. I told him that I was in front of Dultra's Market, and he told me to stay there, and that there would be a truck there to pick me up in a minute. While I was standing there, I saw these lights, you know, moving from right to left across the sky. That's when I felt this fear. Matthews called the base again and informed them that something strange was happening. And he states, When I called the base again, they asked me where I'd been. And he told me, he says, he sent a truck down there already. And I said, well, I've been standing here waiting, and no one's arrived. The Air Force told Bob Matthews that a driver had arrived to pick him up at 8.50 p.m., just five minutes after his first phone call. The driver claimed that Matthews was nowhere in sight. Almost an hour later, at 9.45, the base had received the second call from Matthews. Yet, in Bob Matthews' mind, those two phone calls had been made less than four minutes apart. According to Bud Hopkins, an author on several books on the phenomenon, the missing time Bob Matthews experienced is a mini period of amnesia. And he states, it is not perceived as a break in which something happens and then a resumption. It is remembered as continuous and the half hour trip turns out to be a two hour trip or whatever. 
and this is sometimes experienced in conjunction with a UFO sighting, or something like a light, but not always. In 1964, Hopkins experienced a UFO sighting himself. He has since delved into the field and became an expert on the subject of missing time and alien abduction. And he states, I began getting phone calls from people and letters, and many of their sightings had pieces of missing time in them. They cannot account for what, why something that should have taken 15 minutes took two and a half hours. They drive in a car which involved in a sighting of a UFO. And we began looking into those cases and discovered one after another of these abduction cases. Bob Matthews was one of the people who contacted Bud Hopkins. And he states, I was on vacation looking for something to read. And on the shelf, there in front of me, I saw this book with this creature on it. You know, I read the book and I thought somebody had stepped into my head and taken my innermost fears and put them in a book. It brought tears to my eyes, you know. I couldn't believe this was actually happening to someone else. After weeks of intensive interviews, Bud Hopkins put Bob Matthews under hypnosis to explore the details about what happened to him outside Daltra's market. According to Bud, hypnosis is a very useful tool in retrieving lost memories. And he states, So I connected myself with a psychiatrist and a couple of psychologists who were doing the hypnosis, and we began looking into a number of cases. Bob Matthews' case is a very good missing time case because of the fact that there's an indirect witness to his having been missing. Bob's recollections were so vivid that he was able to return to Cape Cod and reconstruct what he believed took place outside Dultra's market. And he states, Under hypnosis, I observed in the sky three lights moving in this direction. They hovered over here, and the red one came at me so fast. I walked up to the ramp, and I looked inside, and I saw four beings sitting and the place reminded me of a doctor's office this is a drawing of the creature that Bob Matthews says he saw there's no question that Bob Matthews story of alien abduction stretches the imagination the idea of abduction by aliens may seem outrageous. Yet those who have experienced missing time episodes believe that is exactly what happened to them. Of course, there is no proof either way. Perhaps someday science will discover a reason for missing time. Until then, the rest of us should just be glad that all of our minutes have been accounted for. If you yourself have witnessed the paranormal, we'd love to hear your story. Call the toll-free number 
at the bottom of the screen and tell us what you've seen.